I started out my career on Wall Street in investment banking, and on a Friday night, as I was a young man, on a Friday night, I went to a bar called Fridays. And I had made an arrangement with a brother of a friend of mine, I'll call him Joe, uh, to meet me there. And um, I knew very few people. And uh, we went into the bar, and every, every girl there was going, it seemed like, well, not every girl, but way more girls were going up to Joe than they were to me. Nobody, nobody was coming up to me. <laughs> Joe, the <laughs> I was, I was the wingman. Okay, and I, I mean, I mean, I've seen, I've seen certain things before, but I've never seen like flockings of girls to to this guy. And um, I immediately thought to myself, this is not fair. Now. It wasn't what you, only what you think that wasn't fair about this. But what wasn't fair about this was in the back of my mind, there was a difference that I said, there's a difference between meeting a person in Friday's bar uh, in a way that is outside of yourself than meeting a person at what was billed as the friendliest college in America, Quincy College, which is where I went to school. And I was not a sociologist, I was not a psychologist, I was a business man. But I knew that there was something different. And at the same instant, I thought to myself, if I could bottle the difference, I would really have something without having an understanding of what that difference was. And that started me on an avocation, a lifelong avocation of 43 years to understand something that I've been helped by many people along the way, and uh, I haven't been helped by any person more than my wife, Mary Ann. And Mary Ann has uh, stood by me and let me uh, work on this work. Uh, I, I thought wrongly thinking that if there was a great need for something, you could make money at it. No, there's a lot of things that have a great need that you cannot make, there, there's no money to be made on it. And so that meant that it was a cost to our family, both in terms of my time and actually actual money. And um, I could hardly explain to anybody what it was that I was doing, uh, and uh, including to Mary Ann. But she had faith in me, and she stood by me, and she's here tonight, and she's, she's helping me tonight one more time after 43 years. Another person who helped me was my friend Dennis Galligani. I heard from him, uh, he, lived, he, he and I went to the same school and were, 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 were good friends. He went, was in the military, went to Vietnam in a, uh, um, a, um, uh, in, the, in the Navy. Anyway, he came back to California and I'm in New York, he's in California, I'm talking to him, I'm saying how different it is meeting people than in the student union at Quincy College, and he's like, oh, are you kidding me? It's totally different. And that affirmation uh, helped me. I thought, wow, if a person is as, as good as Dennis Galligani can see this, I'm not the only one who can see this. And so that got me going. Okay, so fast forward the clock to um, just recently, uh, when I um, contacted David and um, I said to David, uh, I've got this program, Loquate, you've heard of it before, we worked on it in the JCs, and yeah, will you meet with me? Yes, he will. And then I interviewed him using what I call a communication protocol. And the communication protocol is the output of this 43 years of work. And what it gets at is um, extreme value uh, where work meets faith, where a person feels it, it's an experiential thing. And um, we're trying to create space around a preciousness of God at work in our lives. And I have found by using this communication protocol that it gets at, it helps a person get at 
what is most important to them in the case of Michael's story uh, to uh, make a difference in a person's life. And so he's got his eyes open, his antenna are open, he, he's, he's open, and he sees a guy and he makes a difference. He peels off all of his money. Um, so um, when you talk about providing extreme value to a person who has faith, the name of the program is where work meets faith, they tell you about the faith side. And if any of us thought it was us who was presenting here, nobody would present. But we're creating space around a preciousness of God at work in our lives. So uh, as far as my own faith journey was concerned, before I went to New York, when I was in graduate school, uh, I started, I, I have to say I was away from my church and uh, for a considerable amount of time. And in graduate school, I started to take advantage of the sacraments. And the sacraments I'm referring to are confession and the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And I remember going to confession and a priest saying to me, what a humble confession. And I thought to myself, oh, I'm finally making some progress here. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's uh, through grace that you, you, you change yourself. And so, um, this work, okay, Dennis Galligani, as luck would have it, worked at uh, the University of California in, he got a PhD in higher education, and he, one of his mentors was this guy, Dr. C. Robert Pace. So meanwhile, I'm still s s understanding what it is that I'm, I'm working on here, and uh, Dr. Robert Pace defines sense of community. I have uh, modified his definition of sense of community so you know what I'm talking about when I say what I'm trying to accomplish. And by sense of community, I mean an environment characterized by togetherness and sharing as opposed to cool detachment. The leaders in the environment know the members and go out of their way to be helpful. There is a sense of group loyalty and group support. The atmosphere is cohesive. The environment is a community. Personal diversity is celebrated for its contribution. <coughs> now, how did that help me work out my own salvation? Um, <coughs> I have met many roadblocks in these 43 years, at times where an ordinary person would quit doing, trying to figure this out and how could you, how could you make a difference and why even do it. I've been helped at each step of the way by a person, some important person. Uh, I had made uh, a, a good amount of money and I concentrated on just spending, working on this full time. My family, my extended family said to me, um, what, what is the sense to this? Why are you working on this? A very business minded family. And um, they said, you're not doing what's best for your own family, your wife and your children. And I didn't like to hear that. But I set a time limit as to how long I'd be working on this before I would go back and get a job. And uh, the time came and went. I wasn't successful. I did go back and get a job. And my friend Bill Hart uh, said to me, you can work on it part time. And I thought it was an all or nothing thing. And that so relieved me to think that I could work on it part time. So my point is that if you do things for other people, they'll do things for you. And so I've been helped each step of the way by people who have helped me at critical junctures. We're at one of those points right at this point in time. Um, what are the practical benefits of sense of community? Now imagine this young man who experienced something at Quincy College, something he did not want to give up, something that was very important to him but he couldn't understand it, okay? Then, as I understood the principles that went into this, I had an opportunity at St. Paul of the Cross here in Park Ridge for the last four years to run a program called 
the seminar series, St. Paul of the Cross seminar series where work meets faith. And I found that the uh, sense of community that I was uh, looking for, I had it. I had it through the presentations. I have had 75 presenters so far. And through what you've heard tonight, you've caught a glimpse of, of what this is about. You've got a glimpse of something deep uh, in each of these persons' lives, something that come Monday morning, he will, um, they will be a certain way. We get a glimpse into their values. And I have that same sense of community with these people. Now, most of these people are residents of Park Ridge. I think that these faith-filled, first of all, a person who doesn't have faith won't present in the seminar series where work meets faith. So, but uh, Gallup says that 92% of all people in America believe in God. Uh, that was in May of 2011. Now that's down from 98% uh, in the 50s and 60s. So we, we know that there is a decline but still, there's a lot of people who, who do have faith, and they also do work. And the amazing thing is, is that when these people tell their stories, I'm amazed at how it's God at work in their lives. And then when I see that, that enriches me. And I remember seeing a presenter way at the other side of, uh, uh, going in the center doors of the church, and I'm way far away, and she had just presented, and she saw me, and she gave me a great big wave, you know, like, hi. And, so I had that sense of community for myself. And you know, we're meant to live that way. We're meant to live in community with each other. And um, so that's a practical benefit of this series. Another very practical benefit of this is that each one of the presenters has the opportunity to empower the audience in our, we have uh, freedom of religion and people can um, uh, exercise their, their, their voice and uh, say what they believe in and another person can walk away with one, two, three, four, maybe even five things that they incorporate in their own life. And to that degree, they are affecting the norms of the people to whom they present. Now the norms are the expected behavior of the group. Through the technology of video recording, and then making this available on the internet, there will be many people who will view the, the video. On average, I find that it's 150 times that the video gets viewed. So that means that we have the ability to affect the norms of a community like Park Ridge through these presentations. Now, they're only one presentation at a time. But Remember the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark, when the Ark of the Covenant was found, how all the light came out of the Ark? Okay, maybe you felt that feeling tonight when you heard these two people talking about uh, God at work in their life. So at that point, then God takes over, and it's up to each person to, you know, of what they hear and what they get out of it. So that's why it's, that's why it's so powerful. So, um, now that I've figured it out, okay, now what? Okay, in order for it to continue, it needs other people who want to present. It needs other initiators from our community who want to um, put in their two cents worth for the norms of our community. And um, their power is only the power of truth that other people hear and listen and wish to, to be involved. So I thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Jeff, what was the most interesting talk that you heard during that five, four or five years of making those uh, videos with Mr. Miller here? Obviously, I, I looked at probably 20 because I knew 40 of those people. Wow. And it was amazing to me to hear some of the stories, Tom Swoboda, Mm -hmm. and, and my uh, friend Master Cook, mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, in, in particular, it hit me mm -hmm. uh, where I live, and <clears throat> I, I can tell you this, that hearing stories mm -hmm. about people's lives and how they were affected by others or they affected somebody else, 
has really made a difference, knowing that you're not traveling alone. No, trail. we're not traveling alone. We're not traveling alone, Michael. There's yeah. a lot of people. We're not. We're all of us here. We're yeah. traveling together. So the question is, is what's the most interesting story that I've heard? Yeah. The most interesting story that I didn't hear. The most interesting story was a story I didn't hear. Now what do I mean by that? There was a young man who was in the military who I had a brief understanding of what his experience was and it was a wonderful one of these heroic uh, stories by a, a very faith-filled person. And at the last minute, his commanding officer told him that he did not want him talking about what took place in, in the military. Did not want him talking about that, so he, he backed down. And I thought to myself, wow, who could I ever get to replace this person? That was my first presenter, okay? And then I caught myself, I said, wait a second here, wait. Do I really believe that every person has a story? Do I really believe that it's some person who's great, or do I believe that it is God who's great? And I said, no, I believe that it is God who is great. And what I have found is that every person does have a story. Now, there's a self-elimination process. I'll tap four people on the shoulder to get one who's willing to present. And, but I have never heard a story from a person who's presented that I wasn't deeply moved. Many times, half the times, I'm crying, I'm weeping from hearing, hearing their story. That's how it deeply it touches me. So there's great hope out there with all of us. Any other questions? Well, thank you for coming this evening.